the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. That is the topic of today. We'll start with the Minoans, and then we'll move on to the Mycenaeans. You also see a big compare and contrast between the two, as they are fairly different civilizations. So let's start off with the Minoans. They uh, are going to appear on the island of Crete, which I'll show you here in a second on the map, around 2500 BC or BCE-ish. And the origin of the name actually comes from the Greek legend of the Minotaur. So let me take a second and explain the legend of the Minotaur. The Minotaur was essentially a creature that was half man, half bull, who went and was locked inside a big old maze called the Labyrinth. You can see it here. Um, and in the big labyrinth, every year, seven boys and seven girls had to be sacrificed to this bull. Well, an archaeologist went and found the civilization. And he saw a bunch of bull paintings on the wall, and he saw a big old co palace complex that was, had a bunch of different rooms, and he saw a bunch of bones that made look like there was some human sacrifice. So Arthur Evans, the archaeologist, went and basically termed the civilization the Minoans. We don't know what they called themselves, but this is a term that has been used the past hundred years to go and describe them. The palace complex on Crete is called Knossos, or Knossos, um, which is where there's over 1,200 rooms here. Um, it has everything. It was basically the palace that you can see right here. Uh, the different rooms there were wine processing centers. There were um, work rooms. There was a place for artisans, all that type of stuff. One thing that really goes and defines the Palace of Knossos is the amount of um, artwork about animals, including the bull jumping frescoes. A fresco, rather than being a painting that's painted onto a canvas, is painted directly onto a wall. And I'll show you some of these um, in the bull jumping activity. It was a big old complex, and as you can see, the courtyard, and then four different main entrances as well. Five stories high, absolutely huge. The Minoans tended to go, and most people were ageless, meaning they didn't really put super young or super old people. There was a lot of um, animal printing. You would see birds, uh, grain, flowers, stuff like that, um, and a lot of stuff with bulls. So where are the Minoans? This is Greece, and the Minoans are centered here on Crete, and then also we'll talk about Thera or Santorini as well, because that's going to come into play. So Crete, um, which is where Knossos is. Here's the throne room, and in the throne room of the uh, Minoans, there is a throne right there. So if you go and you look at the throne, um, this is most likely where the king is going to sit. Also as well, if you look into the tub, um, there's kind of, a, some people have thrown out that this was a, um, had to do with gods or goddesses. If you look right here, this is like a tub where there could have been some form of ritual cleansing, baptism, which is what we see in these types of civilizations. If you look, actually, there's a room, basically, room for a woman's buttocks right here, which some have said it was for a priestess or an effigy or a statue of a priestess. Also in this throne room, I'll go and take a deeper look here in a second, and I'll zoom in. There's a picture of a griffin, which is associated with royalty. Um, these were used on royal seals, um, like if you're going to go send a letter as well. Um, but so people either said it's for a priest king or it's for a form of a priestess. Here's the griffin which is the mythical creature which is associated with, um, with royalty as well. As you can see right here, this is obviously restored, but this is the uh, bull fresco, and I'll show you what bull jumping is. It may have had some form of a religious significance. Um, we'll go from there. Here are the different types of pots uh, that we had as well. Uh, fishing, flower gathering, you would have grains, berries, oil, olives, all that type of stuff. And here's a bull jumping fresco. A lot of the guys have to tend to have this reddish color skin, not necessarily because they had that, but it tended to be um, kind of the way they wanted to portray their people. So the bull jumping, what was up with that? Um, it may have been a religious ceremony. Um, it may have just been they worshipped some form of a bull god or goddess. So that was um, maybe something they would think would happen um, in the afterlife or in like the form of heaven, something like that. In addition, the bull jumping... Um, has to do with uh, possibly a sport as well. So bull leaping or bull jumping. Here's another figurine that we found as well. The human's obviously not there to the best, but you can see the concept of jumping over the bull's horns. And here's another guy that's uh, leaping over a bull. More stuff. What did their religion look like? Their religion was a matriarchal religion, meaning it was focused around women, 
matriarchs. They had, um, it was polytheistic, so they had multiple gods and goddesses, but the main uh, people were actually goddesses. We saw a lot of female worship, which is unique to an ancient civilization. We saw mother goddess of fertility, mistress of the animals, protector of the city, the household harvest underworld. They were represented by serpents, birds, poppies, um, all that type of stuff. There is some possible evidence of human sacrifice, which would make sense if the Minoan myth kind of uh, had its source there. So the Minoan myth um, may have some source in, uh, or excuse me, the myth of the Minotaur may have some source in truth of the history of the Minoans. In addition, there's uh, evidence that they were an economic powerhouse and that they did have contact with mainland Greece, meaning they were traders or merchants. Um, like I said, with the human sacrifice, there was actually a guy that they found, basically looked like he died of blood loss, and they found a big old blade that was 15 inches long, which has led some to say that um, there was some human sacrifice involved in their religion. Their writing was a form that we call Linear A. And Linear A, we cannot read. Most likely, it's just kind of um, record-keeping, but we don't have a form of a Rosetta Stone, so we can't read the writing, which is why um, it's kind of up to our guesses. Now, what happened to their civilization? How did it end? It had to do with the uh, island Santorini or Thera. There was a volcano that essentially blew up. And when this blew up, it obviously destroyed uh, much of Santorini, including the ruins of the city of Akrotiri, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, but it also caused a tidal wave, which went and moved the buildings there on Crete. The event in and of itself didn't destroy the civilization, but it helped slow it down, meaning it weakened them economically, which allowed them to go and get conquered by outsiders, specifically the other civilization that we talk about today, the Mycenaeans. So the Mycenaeans are going to come along and then go from there. In addition, the myth of Atlantis, of a, of a society going and falling into the sea, comes from there as well. The idea that there was a civilization that disappeared. Some people have thrown that out there. Plato's Atlantis also may just be a story, and he was trying to prove a political and moral point. But the idea of possibly having a real civilization, um, Akrotiri, the idea that the city that was discovered um, could be this Atlantis, is out there. The way Akrotiri was found is actually a Greek farmer was on his donkey and fell into a sinkhole um, about 40 years ago-ish. And when he fell into the sinkhole, he went and landed basically in a living room of the Minoan civilization, and they've done some excavations there, and I'll show you some pictures here in a sec. Um, and that's where they get the ruins of Akrotiri. So the end of the Minoan civilization was caused by the explosion on Thera, which caused the tidal wave um, to destroy much of Crete, which ruined their economic power, uh, powerhouse ability, and then they were taken over by the Mycenaeans. Here's the lovely uh, steep cliffs. Sorry, I can't talk. Steep Cliffs of Santorini, which has to do with the volcanic explosion, has the very, very famous pretty um, white house. Here's the snake goddess. So this is, like I said, they were a matriarchal religion. As we look here, um, she's holding snakes, which are associated with fertility um, and renewal, because think about the snake uh, shedding their skin. Obviously, she's bare-chested, uh, which suggests she does have some fertility um, qualities to her. In addition, like I said in class, it's kind of a strange concept, but... Um, it was also common in ancient Greece for a woman to expose her breasts if she was in mourning. So it could be a statue of mourning as well, which is a bit strange and odd to us, but that's another possible theory. But most likely it's some form of a fertility god. Here are the ruins um, at, at Akrotiri. In 2005, one of the roofs actually fell on top of somebody. So they've, uh, as far as I know, they've closed the ruins to tourists, but very, uh, very well preserved. The one best argument against this being Atlantis, however, is if you look, there are no skeletons that they found there. So if it was an overnight volcano exploding, there would have been people there. No skeletons mean, means they obviously had left for some reason. So Atlantis, uh, it kind of, it's still up in debate, which is kind of fun about history because there's never a definite answer. We're still trying to find a lot of this stuff out. You can pause this here. This is kind of cool, an aerial view of how um, much they've gone and excavated uh, Akrotiri. Like I said, a lot of dolphins, um, a lot of birds, and a lot of monkeys. There go, and you look at this, it's a, it's a, what we call a peaceful civilization, kind of like I said, it kept people feel good, it's a hippie type um, place to live. In addition to this animal nature, there's a sense of brutality as well. Even though they're not a, a military force, um, they did still have ancient forms of boxing, which will become later, obviously, incorporated into the Olympics. Now we move to the Mycenaeans, the people that went 
and came on after the Minoans. So the concept of Troy, I got to go step back a second and talk about Troy, including Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, the Trojan Wars, the myth. Because this myth, just like the myth of the Minotaur, has some basis, most likely, in truth. Okay, so here's the myth of um, the Iliad. There's two sides. There's the Greeks, and then there's the Trojans. Essentially, what happens is this. There's three different goddesses. There's Hera, there's Aphrodite, and there's Athena. And there's a golden apple, and they're fighting over the golden apple. And a human, his name is Paris, gets to go and choose which one is the fairest, or like the most beautiful of them all. And they all go and they try to sway, uh, sway Paris. And eventually he chooses the goddess of love, Aphrodite. And his reward is he gets to choose basically any woman to fall in love with him. And he chooses Helen of Troy. Basically, she's going to become a part of Troy. Um, she goes and is actually married at the time, which is not good. So Paris is going to basically make Helen fall in love with him, take her back home to Troy. She's a, he's a homewrecker with her. And she is known as the person whose ship la launched a thousand faces. You have the Trojan War with Achilles. The Trojans versus the Greeks, and if you know the story, the Greeks eventually defeat the Trojans um, using the Trojan horse. Um, they hide this guy's in there, and they go and they um, kill the Trojans really long. And then you have the Odyssey, which is um, Odysseus' story of going and traveling home after the Trojan War. Okay, that's the story. Now the question is, was there really a, a battle between Greeks and the Trojans? And if so, um, where were the Trojans? We know where the Greeks were. This comes down to a German named Heinrich Schliemann. Sorry, the end's cut off there. It's two ends. Um, Heinrich Schliemann was a guy, interesting guy, strange guy, a lot of money. Um, he actually went and married a 17-year-old uh, Greek girl, and he was a lot older than her. He loved his Greek um, philosophy and literature so much, he actually, during his children's baptism, he would go and um, essentially, um, he actually took a copy of the Iliad and put it on their heads rather than a copy of the Bible, kind of sacrilegious there. But um, he went and essentially discovered Troy. And some of his exagger some of the stuff may be exaggerations to a bit. He's kind of a showman. But we do know if there was a Troy, we have a location most likely where it was. I'll show you where that is um, in modern day Turkey or the region what we call Anatolia. The Mycenaeans, we can read their we can actually read their language. It's called Linear B. Nothing too exciting, a lot of just records as well. So what are the differences from the Minoans? Well, with the Mycenaeans, we can actually go and we can read their writing. Like I said. The Minoans are more militaristic, um, so they depend more on their military, while the Mycenaeans, oh, excuse me, I'm flipping it. The Mycenaeans are militaristic, and the Minoans um, are, more the, are more the peaceful, excuse me. I think you know what I'm talking about. And then I also have the Tholos tombs, which I'll show you. They're these beehive-shaped tombs that are very, very Mycenaean, distinctive of the Mycenaean civilization. In order to go and be a military powerhouse, they have to build strong fortresses, strong palaces, and they form these palace citadels or uh, palace fortresses on top of the hill. These have secret passageways, um, cisterns to go and fight for long battle, and the walls are as thick as 26 feet thick. The walls are so big, and they're just stones uh, stacked on top of each other, there's no mortar, that they're called Cyclopean, referring to this dude right here, the Cyclops, because later civilizations basically said Cyclops had built them, because there's no way a human could have built it. Obviously, one-eyed monster, as much as we want them to be real, did not build it. But I'll show you. They're absolutely just huge. So, what are we talking about? You can see the Minoans, right, are in Thera or Santorini, and then Crete. And then the Mycenaeans are more mainland Greece. They're taking over from there. Well, when we go and fight the Trojan War, this is Anatolia. This is where Troy would be. So, the, here's Mycenae. And then um, Anatolia is where the Trojans would be. That's where um, Heinrich Schliemann found them. Here's the Tholos tomb, which are the underground beehive-style tombs that the people would have been buried in. They're covered with dirt on the outside that would have been buried with treasures for the afterlife. And then here's an excavation of how you can go inside the Tholos tomb today. You can see the Lion's Gate, what it would have looked like back, in, what it would have looked like back in the day. And then here's what it looks like today. No heads. I know, it's so sad. But like I said, it's huge. And then the question here, was it built by Cyclops? These big old stones stacked on top of each other. Obviously, a monster didn't build it. It would be cool if a monster built it, but that's not exactly the way it happened. Um, so that's where you get the term Cyclopean. So the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. The Mino Minoans tend to be the more peaceful of the two, uh, more mysterious because we can't read their writing, but they kind of end kind of awesomely because they have to do with a volcano blowing up and stuff blowing up is always awesome. And the Mycenaeans have to do with more of a militaristic rule, building these palace fortresses, 
with these big old stones that are called Cyclopean, and also the concept. Uh, the discovery of the city of Troy, which may have actually some basis in history, not all entirely myth.